Welcome back, everybody, to Next Week with Jeff Durbin. I am Jeff Durbin, so thankful you all have joined us. Make sure you guys like and share the episode. Spread it across them internets. And make sure you guys go to apologiastudios.com. For more content, hundreds of radio shows, podcasts, you can get the TV shows, the after shows, Apology Academy, all that is over at apologiastudios.com, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A studios.com. Don't forget also, if you want to get your church equipped and in the fight against the issue of abortion, save lives together with us. If you want immediate justice in the area of abortion, go to endabortionnow.com to get your church free training, free resources, and to join the nearly 500 churches really globally that have teamed up under the banner of End Abortion Now with local churches bringing the gospel into conflict with abortion. Endabortionnow.com is where you guys go. And oh boy, oh boy, are we in some interesting times right now. We are facing some very interesting questions uh, in our nation right now. Really, of course, globally, yes, but in, in the United States of America, we're facing some very, very important questions related to law, justice, Freedom, protection, safety, defense, all those things are right now up in front. And I think the big issue right now before all of us in the United States of America is the issue of mortality. People are considering mortality a lot more right now with COVID and uh, with the, the novel coronavirus issue that we're all facing. And of course, we have elders of churches, pastors having to make very hard decisions right now in terms of how to love all people, love the people of their congregation, love their neighbors, uh, we're asking all kinds of questions in terms of civil rights, um, the government uh, authority, government power. What kind of power do they have? Is it unlimited power? Uh, Romans 13, the state as God's deacon, uh, the one who wields the sword of justice, protects the righteous. What kind of uh, authority do they have? Is it unlimited authority? Do we just have to yield and obey Romans 13 every single time? Is there ever a time where we can say, um, we need to be, obey God rather than men. So we are facing very, very interesting times. And the beautiful thing is we have a word from God as to what the truth is. That is God's word in the Holy Bible. And so that's a true gift for us. But we actually wanted to touch really two different subjects today that were really interconnected in a lot of ways. One was the issue of gun rights, the Second Amendment. And the other one is, of course, what's going on across our country with... Um, uh, martial law essentially being declared in numerous cities. We have uh, mandatory curfews, businesses being forced down, uh, forced to shut down. We have many, many, many people being laid off, losing their jobs, losing their ability to provide for their families, for their children. Uh, now, I'm saying all this not to, create, not to create anxiety or worry. The Bible says to be anxious for nothing, to be anxious about nothing, to rejoice in all things, and not to worry about our lives. But it really is to answer important questions. That's what we need to be doing. What does God's Word say about justice? What's God's <clears throat> Word say about law? What does God's Word say about the authority of the state? What's God's Word say about the authority of the church? What's God's Word say about the ability to defend yourself with a weapon? That's what we're here to do. We're going to answer those questions today with a very good friend of ours and our special guest, Zach Lautenschlager. He is with National Association for Gun Rights and he's here to help us answer some of those questions. Zach, welcome, brother. Thanks for joining us right here on Next Week. Howdy, right, Jeff. Good to talk with you again. Good to talk with you, brother. So we got to see Zach a bit in Oklahoma recently, dealing with some issues of justice there for the pre-born. Uh, and so Zach is always a breath of fresh air for all of us. He has a lot of insight and a lot of godly wisdom. And uh, Zach, I'd like to bring you in by way of talking about the issue of the Second Amendment. You work, uh, you've worked with, consulted for, the National Association for Gun Rights. Uh, let me just start with this. From the perspective of many of our listeners and friends are around the world, they, they can't understand the American obsession with guns. Um, are, are you a big believer in the Second Amendment and gun rights because you just believe in America? Like, what's, what's feeding that? What's the blood pumping through your veins when you think about the Second Amendment? Well, anyone who believes in the right to life, if they think about it and ask themselves, how does this work biblically, is going to come to the conclusion that the right to defend that life is, is antecedent. Um, you cannot have a right to life if you cannot defend it. And therefore, the right to self-defense is, uh, is fundamental. And therefore, the right to keep and bear arms is fundamental. Um, we can look all throughout Scripture. If a man is found in your house at night and you strike him so that he die, you are not guilty of bloodshed. Um, if you dive into that and look at uh, how that works with 
uh, commandments uh, and how we're required uh, to respect life, not to take it, uh, not to murder. But that also means on the flip side, we're required to defend it. Right. And therefore, I, it's not just an American thing. Um, in fact, it's a distinctly uh, biblical concept. Um, so very good. That's uh, that's one. Very very good. So in working with National Association for Gun Rights, what are the kinds of things happening right now that people need to be aware of within the last six weeks, two months, or three months? What do we need to be aware of in terms of an assault on our God-given right to self-defense and the preservation of life? via a weapon? What, what are the things that we need to be informed about? And about? Well, it, the reason we have a Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is to bar government, specifically in that case the federal government, but the state constitutions have their own similar requirements, uh, from restricting uh, the lawful possession and lawful use of firearms. Um, and that means uh, constitutionally that if the uh, if the military, an individual soldier in the military, can have can possess that weapon, so can you. That is what the Second Amendment means. We can debate whether or not we like that, but it's hard to debate whether or not that's what the Second Amendment says. And so the importance, there are, there are multiple reasons to, to possess a, a weapon. If we're talking in the abstract, constitutionally, the reason the founders put it in uh, the Bill of Rights is to guarantee uh, the ability of the citizens to stand up to a tyrannical government. That's what it's for. Very good. Um, secondary secondary, is not very far secondary. It's, it's part and parcel. It's about self-defense from a tyrannical government. Um, now, there, that has to be used very carefully, um, and we can talk about that further, but um, growing from that, then, is your right to defend yourself from anyone else who is threatening life or limb or sometimes property. Um, so, um, you know, from a, from an individual standpoint, am I worried that I'm going to have to uh, start uh, or participate in a hot war with my government? Well, I sure hope not, and I don't believe that's eminent. Um, that's why I do what I do, because we have the best system in the world for restraining our government. If it falls apart, we have truly failed. No people... In recent history, we're talking thousands of years, have ever had a better opportunity and a better ability to reign in their government without using physical violence than we do. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, am I concerned that someone could break into my house? Sure, it could happen. It happens every day to someone. And so the ability to uh, stop a violent attack, uh, wherever it may be, is a key reason to, to possess a firearm. Uh, it certainly is the great equalizer. Um, and for especially for people who are weaker um, than than your average person, uh, the firearm is absolutely necessary to defending life, and therefore is necessary to uh, at least the concept of life itself. That's right. So there was something recently that happened in the state of Virginia. Can you update us on what that was all about? Sure. So you were talking about the fact that in Virginia, Democrats uh, finally took over control of both the, both the governor's mansion and both houses of the state legislature. Um, and they proceeded to do, unfortunately, what Democrats do when they get full control, and that is to, <laughs> to sign a blood pact to pass gun control over the strenuous objections of their constituents. Um, and to some, it is going to be polit a political a death pact in the sense that they are going to lose uh, politically for having passed that gun control. But they did so over the objections of the people. Um, that does happen sometimes. Um, you do not win them all. And is it the end of the world? No, it's absolutely not. We may see the, the state change hands because of that draconian um, effort. Uh, but the, the state legislature did pass uh, laws heavily restricting the right to keep arms. We were able to stop the assault weapons ban, which was fast track that there was such a heavy outcry, but they did get uh, what they call universal background checks, which we would call gun registration and several other things. Um, they passed it through one of the chambers two days after there was at least a, a rally of about 40,000 people in the streets around the Capitol, if you've ever been to the Virginia Capitol in Richmond. It sits on a hill. 
kind of a hillside and the streets around it all. You look up at the Capitol and those streets and all the ground that was open was so full of people that you, it was just, it was phenomenal. Right, I heard about, I heard um, about that. It was a that. tremendous rally, yeah. but it demonstrates that rallies do not win political fights. Rallies can be a, a good part of the fight, um, but what it takes is concentrated effort. You have to convince the politicians that um, you are capable of ending their careers if necessary. Very good. Yeah, I, I did see that, Zach. I saw that there was uh, 40,000 white supremacists um, uh, uh, coming to attack the Hill. <laughs> Black white supremacists, no less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, people, people of color who were apparently also white supremacists. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Who knew? Yeah. Powerful thing to think about. So when you think about moving forward over the course of, say, the next four years, National Association for Gun Rights, you have other, other gun, uh, Second Amendment protection organizations. What are some of the things we need to be concerned about and be willing to essentially um, engage in to make sure there's a preservation of our ability to preserve life, to defend life? The most important thing is to recognize a few things. First of all, politics is not the art of compromise. Politics is confrontation and mobilization. Confrontation with the politicians, mobilization of the people finding people who agree with us and getting them involved in the fight. Um, there are, sure, there are some states in California, New York, Massachusetts, that are demographically, you're not going to win there. Um, and they are going to do things. The best that a person can do is probably either throw themselves into the, into the machinery of government, so to speak, gum up the works, cause problems, protest. We have our friends and allies in those states who do, but in almost all, every other state in the nation, there are more than enough people who support the, the right to keep arms, who support the Second Amendment, who support uh, whatever section of their state constitution guarantees that right. And so the importance of getting involved in the fight and standing up, uh, not just in a, oh, great, we're going to go to a rally. Rallies are fine. Rallies can be beneficial. But I, we're going to do the daily work of, oh, hey, look, we need here's the bill number. I need to make a call. And that is, or I need to send an email, or I sign a petition, or I will donate. Um, that is the work of the National Association for Gun Rights. That is our strong suit, and we do it differently and better than anyone else, any other gun group in the nation. Um, we can talk about the National Rifle Association, which um, ultimately is not really a pro-gun organization. They are a business lobby primarily. When you look at their bottom line, most of their money comes from manufacturers. That's not a bad thing, but we should not imagine that the that the interests of major gun manufacturers is even remotely similar to that of the individual gun owner. Glock does not have the same interests that you and I do. Very good. Um, now, the, we can talk about other groups like Gun Owners of America. Those, they're good allies, and they're good with their media work. Um, we specialize in grassroots mobilization. We do it better than anyone else. Um, and when you want to look at uh, the constitutional carry movement, which is now swept through 15 states and is gaining steam, was on the verge of passing. We had it in Tennessee uh, until just this week. The Tennessee legislature paused. Um, they may be back, and if they do, it, it will almost certainly pass there. Um, we've introduced it in several other states this year. Um, so uh, you can look at, at look at that movement. And so getting involved in the grassroots fight. There are many people who look at it and say, well, media work is important. You know what? Media work is important. Um, but unless we're talking about this kind of media, which is run by uh, brothers with whom we would agree, you're talking about the fake news media, who does not agree with you, and you are not going to get a fair shake there. It's important to be fighting. It's important to be seen fighting. But they're not going to publish what you say. They publish what they want to say. Um, and that is the importance of building our own communication structures, which we have done. We have 4.5 million members nationwide. We have grown that group over the last decade in the time that I've been there. From 700,000 to four and a half million. That was not just my work, but I did get to participate in that, and I'm thankful to have done so. And now, when we want to mobilize people, we do. Uh, we change the outcome of elections. We change what happens with with legislation um, through the appropriate uh, political or, or organizational structure. And so, being involved and being able to coordinate and work with gun owners and liberty lovers is really where it's at. Very good. Uh, the National Association for Gun Rights does it best when it comes to guns. Excellent. So let's uh, change topics for a moment here. But again, these, these are all interconnected things in terms of government, uh, the authority of government, the reach of government, the power of government. So obviously we have to face the difficulties um, ahead of us that are related to the issue of the novel coronavirus. And we have seen over the last two weeks some pretty sweeping 
um, moments of uh, government power and control. Um, we're aware, just with an apology at church over the last week, of families who have uh, lost their jobs, lost income, uh, businesses locally being shut down. Just got word today uh, from one of the members of our body who is uh, the head of a major, major organization in Arizona. He had to lay off over 250 employees just today and more coming tomorrow. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about love for neighbor. That's one of the things that's being highlighted a lot right now. People are saying we need to love our neighbors, and the answer is, of course we do. And, of course, there's issues of justice related to quarantine and biblical law and all the rest. But I think one of the things that's happening a lot right now is people are just saying Romans 13, peanut butter, smeared on the sandwich. Uh, they have uh, the right to exercise authority. The church must submit and obey. And it's interesting because that same Bible that has Romans 13 in it also has a story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their disobedience to the government and the refusal to obey the government. Uh, and, of course, we have Peter. Uh, in the book of Acts, who says we must obey God rather than men. So at least for the, the, the biblical prophets, the biblical heroes, the submission to government is the assumption that the government is being God's deacon, God's servant in a consistent way, that they're acting in a godly and not an unrighteous way. My, my concern at the moment, brother, is my concern is when we talk about the principle of love for neighbor, I'm, I'm the first in line to say, sign me up stamp my hand. I want to come and see that show. I love it. Uh, love your neighbor. That's the second greatest commandment. First one's love God. And so what my concern is at the moment as a pastor, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing the devastation before this, even, this thing has even really gotten off the ground, the devastation that it's uh, uh, wreaking upon my neighbors, uh, families, yeah. family businesses, uh, children um, who don't have food to eat, uh, babies who aren't going to have diapers, um, I'm, I'm seeing the, the husbands and the wives out of work, um, and I think we're just, just re I said it to the elders the other day, I said that we're just beginning to smell this thing. We haven't been down yet, um, and I'm, I'm concerned, not worried. I know God is in control. I'm concerned, and I, I'd like to have you speak to that, Zach. We have governments now shutting cities down for three weeks, 24-hour lockdowns. We have governments now actually uh, commandeering private property to stick homeless populations in. We have governments uh, shutting down, say, the, in the city of Las Vegas, all non-essential businesses and operations that to be closed. Um, and we have, uh, say, for example, we have a church on the island of Kauai, and the mayor of Kauai issued a mandate, a law, that said that there was a 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. lockdown across uh, Kauai, where you had to be in your residence or in your hotel room. If you exited or you were found outside of it, you would be fined uh, up to $5,000 or up to one year in jail you could get uh, for being outside. So the businesses that were open between 9 and midnight are now closed. Those workers are now not getting paid. Um, obviously, this creates a, a, a disastrous situation economically. And there's a concern here about whether we're really loving our neighbors. Is it wise to follow yeah. a state who makes these kinds of decisions with the stream of the media and the populace who are panicking? Is it wise to actually destroy our neighbors' livelihoods in this way? Zach, help us to answer these questions. What are your thoughts? Now, these are great questions. I think that if we start with Romans 13, we, ha we have to understand, as my good friend and, and mentor Joe Moorcraft says, Romans 13 is prescriptive, not descriptive. In other words, it prescribes the duties and the boundary of those duties. It does not simply say you have to obey no matter what. That's laughable. That is absolutely laughable. You can look at every single hero. Look at the, uh, the Faith Hall of Fame, as it were. Most of those people are there because at one time or another, they stood up and said, no, that is a bad law. And I will fight it. Now, for what, if fighting, what, what fighting it looks like depends. You ask the question, should we follow a government which is doing these things? Well, you know, I think that this all gets mixed up and thinking gets mixed up. And my uh, many friends who are still unraveling this, and I'm unraveling it to some degree. But I think we first of all have to understand, look, is it uh, both wise and kind to practice some kind of social distancing? Meaning, staying away, you know, keeping your distance from people. As, as far as, you know, if you are in public, not getting too close, um, not going places you don't have to go. Um, sure, voluntarily, absolutely. I think that's, that's wise and kind. Um, 
does that mean we practice social distancing to the point we close up our churches? No, absolutely not. And I would never suggest that. I do know some churches that have made the decision, hey, we think we can minister to our people uh, and do so using Facebook and some different things. I think that's a, uh, that's a decision they are free to make. I'm not sure they actually can, but the, there are godly men who are making decisions along those lines. Okay. But I think that whole question, what about social distancing? Well, I think loving your neighbor may mean practicing some of that. Question number two then is, well, can government, can government, off, can and should government offer guidelines? Maybe. Depends on what those guidelines are. Are they good guidelines or are they bad right, guidelines? Right. They're bad guidelines. No, they shouldn't be offering those. And we should tell them that's stupid. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be asking businesses to shut down and ruin the economy even if you're not forcing it. That's not a good idea. Um, but is it within the bounds of, uh, within the reasonable bounds of the constitutional and biblical grounds for government to make recommendations? Sure, in theory, yeah. But then the question really is, okay, but is it okay for government to use force to send the police and the National Guard to require people to follow what probably are ill-advised guidelines to start with? We're gonna shut down businesses. Um, in Ohio, uh, I forget the name of the town, but after De Governor DeWine made his pronouncements and shut the state down, uh, the, um, some patrons of a particular buffet continued to partake, and there were about 40 people in there. So the police showed up, kicked them all out, and bolt boarded the door over, screwed a big piece of plywood over the door, mm -hmm. and are now maintaining that. And the, the, uh, the official pronouncement from the mayor of that particular town was, well, this puts first responders at risk. That's laughable. <laughs> Who showed up to board the door? Yes. Oh, you mean we didn't send first responders? Of course they did. They showed up and board, boarded up the door. And then is it within the bounds, within reasonable bounds for government to say, well, we don't think it's safe to send first responders out? Of course. We do that all the time. There are bad neighborhoods that police sometimes just don't go. Is that a good thing? No. But is it within, is it within their jurisdiction to say, yeah, we're not sending people in there? Sure. If I do something foolish and the paramedic doesn't want to come rescue me, that's on me. It's not on them. So there is, there's a lot of that panicked thinking. You see government then, and why is government doing this? Well, most of the people in a government are not equipped to actually make good decisions. They are not. They are neither spiritually, um, theologically, um, or, or equipped with enough wisdom just from a plain common sense perspective to make decisions like this, they just want to do their jobs and be, be paid bureaucrats. That's what they got, they didn't sign up for this. That's the problem. They should have, but they didn't. And so their motivation is, well, what will keep me safe? What will, what will keep my job safe? Well, no amount of panic in a situation like that can really be blamed too much from their perspective. They're always gonna go overboard. So that's what we see them doing. So what's our response? What should our response be? We still, we, they still answer to us. That is the point of the, the American system. We are yielding that, and we should not, and we must not. We must stand up. Now, it begins to get very serious when the government forcibly keeps people from feeding their families and forcibly keeps people from defending themselves. And we see that. We see both happening. The first happening much more than the second so far, but there are multiple towns, counties across this nation that are including... Uh, uh, emergency powers to control, and the language is always the sale uh, and transport of, and then they say firearms, alcohol, tobacco, blah, 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 explosives, um, combustibles. They throw it all in together. Well, that's, that includes firearms and ammunition. Mm -hmm. So they are limiting your ability to transport, which means possess. You can't transport it, you can't have it, ever, period. Maybe you can have it in your home, but if you leave your home, no. And even in your home, it's questionable. And then there's the question of sale. Um, many, many people suddenly woke up this week, late last week, and said, I think I'm going to need a gun. And they're going out and trying to buy them. Huge numbers are shocked and horrified that they can't just buy them off Amazon. They can't buy them online. Um, That's a good point. This is the first day of looking at it. Yep. And you know what? They're right. You should be able to buy firearms online. Of course you should be able to. That's laughable. It's absurd to say that you can't possess a handgun. I had, 
Amazon style. But that's what we're finding out. We have people who are discovering, people who are discovering that, wow, my government can be a real problem sometimes. Um, so there, it is a difficult time. Um, how do we respond to all of this? Well, I think that we do love our neighbors, both by going along with some of this in the sense of, sure, I'll be careful. I'll respect my immunocompromised neighbors. I'm going to call them on the phone and ask them, hey, do you need something to go get groceries? And I'll go get groceries and put it on the front porch. Um, or I will show my friends online that, no, I'm not just saying go and sneeze on everyone. Don't worry about it. Ignore it. Um, my good friend, Dr. Coleman Boyd from Mississippi today had some good things to say about, some balanced things to say about, look, this is a, this is a serious disease. Um, it should be handled with care, but the way we're going about it is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. If I can, Coleman, hopefully, if you're listening, I've, I've paraphrased you honestly. Please call me out if I haven't. Um, but, and then loving our neighbor on the other side, destroying, and we talk about destroying our economy as if it was some kind of uh, abstract concept. And we're really talking about, as you said, keeping people from feeding their families. There are children who are hungry right now, thanks to this. Some of them are hungry because they don't get, they don't eat enough at home, and they depend on the schools for food. Some of them are hungry because their parents have lost their jobs. Some of them are hungry because uh, there are other issues. Um, and so that is wrong. It is absolutely evil for government to, yeah. to, to do that, right. to proceed to that level. Right. And we need to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. And for the churches that have bravely decided, no, we are going to meet anyway, because that is what's necessary to fulfill our calling. Um, as I know Apologia has, and I really appreciated you guys' statement, I think it was late last week, about uh, how you're going to proceed. Um, kudos. That is exactly the right, the right approach. All of us need to be standing up and saying, no, that's too far. And we will, there will be, there will be um, opposition to this. Yeah. And then, then the question is, well, what about all of the uncertainty? Can we handle the uncertainty? Well, we need to take care of our families first. For those who didn't have a firearm already, for those who don't, who couldn't survive for at least a couple weeks, should be a couple months, without going to the store. Um, you know, and that makes all of us go, ouch, well, I don't know if I could actually survive. For, you know, could I survive for six months? Could I survive how long? It's always the question. But most people can't survive a week without going to the grocery That's store. That's right. Or a couple of Start days. <laughs> a that, couple of days. That is that, not yeah. a good place to be. No. No, That's you're absolutely That's right. Thank you, brother, so much for giving us insight and input, wisdom, and on this issue. I'd, I'd love to have you back soon, sooner than later. That's Zach Lautenschlager, everybody, National Association for Gun Rights. Uh, Zach, where do you want people to go to get more information from you or to be a part of what you're doing? You can check out National Association for Gun Rights. Just Google it or go to nagr.org. That's n-a-g-r.org. Uh, it's a great place to get involved in the gunfight. Um, and uh, I know we're working on a couple other things. We're looking forward to rolling out uh, red state reform. I don't know if you guys are talking about that very much yet. But That'll be coming up very soon. Very excited yep. about that. Yep. Absolutely. We'll be seeing lots more of your face, brother. Thank you so much for your counsel and wisdom. Thanks so much for your input today. Look forward to talking to you soon, brother. Bless you, Pastor. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, brother. All right, everybody. Be right back. I stay with us. Quick commercial break. We'll be right back. And the bear and myself are going to be sitting right here having a big discussion about novel coronavirus. What does it mean to love your neighbor right now? What's it mean? How do we do it consistently? What principles from God's word are we supposed to be upholding so that we love God and love our neighbor rightly? Stay with us, guys. Be right back. Make sure you share the episode. Let everyone know all about it. At the Runner Academy, we arm and train emerging leaders to live out their calling in a way that truly honors Christ as the Lord of all things, especially in areas like medicine, law, politics, education, the church, business, and the arts. The Runner Academy is hosted at the EICC Center for Reformational Culture, an environment that provides a healthy balance of work and rest, and that stimulates creative discussion for engaging with and shaping culture to the glory of God. On this 24-acre farm and retreat center, delegates can expect to find challenging teaching but also fun and fellowship with like-minded Christians who are concerned to recover a vision of God's glory and who are committed to think through what it means to live the Christian life in all its fullness. Apply today and get equipped to face the critical issues of our time with a deep, rich and joyful confidence in the Lordship of Jesus Christ 
over all life and culture. I want their faith to not just be something that stands, but something around which culture can be built. We want students who can um, think critically about arguments, but also about the culture around them, that can then speak clearly to it, and that also have the ability to influence and shape because of the power of their message. Because that's really what the gospel does. The gospel throws down all the arguments against it. It speaks to the hearts of people, it influences, and it changes. The goal for New St. Andrews College, as it trains its students, is not to make people who will be able to go out and just get jobs, people who will just be bricks in the wall of our society. The goal for New St. Andrews College is to make students into men and women who will really impact culture. Go to ApologiaStudios.com, get signed up, partner with us on All Access, you get all of the radio programs, you get the TV show, you get the after show, including Apologia Academy, and you partner with us in ministry, bringing the gospel around the world. Welcome back, everybody. It's next week with Jeff Durbin. I am Jeff Durbin. This is Luke the Bear. What up? We're glad you guys joined us for another episode of next week. Very important uh, discussion we're going to be having over the next couple of weeks and maybe even the next couple of months, perhaps from prison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's only a couple yeah, weeks. That's right, that's right. So as everybody knows, we're dealing uh, as a nation now and as individual states with the issue of the novel coronavirus. Um, and we're asking, having to ask a lot of questions now. I know many of you are watching this right now and you're struggling because you have been laid off. Mm. Uh, you've lost your jobs. Perhaps, sadly, some of you guys have lost family businesses. Uh, that perhaps have been in your, your family for two generations and now you have lost that business, you're not able to recover from this already and we've only just began to touch uh, the situation. And so for, I want to start this by saying uh, we want to address this pastorally and, and right. very, with, with a sensitive heart, uh, with love and with humility. Uh, all of us, especially pastors right now, are trying to manage different biblical principles as we face something like this in our society that, of course, we have to all admit we didn't necessarily see coming like this, oh, no. this quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we want to address this today, very short ending to the episode. We're going to be doing more across our platform. should be able to look at that as well. We want to address this issue and really address it in terms of, I think, the biblical principles, right. not our emotions. Exactly. We don't want to become fireballs and just start breathing fire uh, over our just personal pontification and just my own preferences, that sort of a thing. But really, addressing this as Christians, principle, loving God, loving neighbor, of course, the issue of the government. And one of the things that uh, Lautenschlager said was the government's passage in Romans 13 is prescriptive, not descriptive. Mm. It's, it's prescriptive of what the government's role is, right. supposed to be. Right. It's not descriptive of what the government always does. Right, exactly. Very important. Uh, let, let's... Let's start with this. Um, one of the things that you and I have been talking a lot about the last week is we're fearful, if mm. you can use that word in a, yeah. in a righteous way, fearful of seeing Christians that are, that are very solid believers, they love the Lord, immediately jumping into the stream with the media, with the government and the culture of, of there's, there's the fear there's the panic going on. I'm not saying these pastors are panicking, right. but jumping into the stream saying, okay, we'll go along with where you're all saying we're supposed to go. Right. Um, and people will just take, and I've been saying this a lot lately, like they'll, they'll slather it like peanut butter over the, over the Romans 13. Romans 13. Yeah. Uh, be subject to governing authorities. There's no authority except given by God. And then it describes the role of the government is to be God's servant, mm. wield the sword of justice, protect the righteous. Mm. And so let's say, well, this is an instance where the government has just said you need to obey. Mm. Now, our concern on the front end, we want to say this right away, 
is love for neighbor. Yeah. And everyone goes, oh, that's really cool because that's why I say you should be the government yeah. when they shut everything down. And then what I want to say is, no, no, I mean really love neighbor across the board. Right. Uh, not just some neighbors, but love our neighbor. And love for neighbor demands me as a pastor and you as a pastor to ask questions. Yeah. Like, for example, Monday was a day where we started getting the phone calls that we have families now who are out of work. Right. And this thing just kicked off. Right. Families out of work, people who aren't, don't know how they're going to be able to feed themselves or take care of their families, those sorts of things. These are questions being asked right now. Of course, we got uh, one of our deacons who had to lay off 256 employees today, today yeah. and tomorrow More. starts the next yeah. run. Uh, and again, this is just the beginning of this. And we already see, of course, across social media, local businesses saying, we're so sorry. We've been glad to serve you for the last 10 years, 20 years, but we're going to have to close our doors. They couldn't make it the next 30 days without a customer. Right. Um, and there's a lot of businesses like that. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to, they're just trying to basically keep their yeah. heads above water. You know, they might have seasons where they're doing well, but maybe this was a season where they were just trying to keep their head above yeah. water and they can't make it the two weeks or the, or the 60 days or the 30 days without money. So our concern is for those neighbors. Yeah. If the government is taking these drastic steps to decimate the economy, which is what they're doing, um, because of a virus, we have to ask the question, okay, is it appropriate to quarantine on that level right mm. now? Because biblically speaking, there are the issues of quarantine. Right. Exactly. Quarantine that have to do with loving neighbor and guarding the people from right. somebody who's really sick. Leprosy, of course, we, we know what that disease is, but leprosy was a term that we used actually kind of interchangeably even with other plagues. So you could also put plague in there for mm. quarantine. But the question is, how, how did that work biblically? And is this a case at the moment where it actually um, qualifies to decimate the national economy and to destroy? Yeah. Millions upon millions upon millions of families. We're talking about children who aren't going to have food. We're talking about, uh, like I said, the Zach. We're talking about babies that won't be able to get, won't be able to get formula for. Um, and uh, somebody says, no, no, don't, don't worry. We have uh, unemployment stuff, and we've got uh, the ability to actually just you know, give out money to some of these families for a temporary time period. And what I want to say is we clearly don't understand how money works. No. And also, uh, we clearly don't understand the biblical law uh -huh. against coveting and against theft. Yeah. Because how are you going to pay? When, when the government decimates the economy and destroys our neighbors, which is very unloving, by the way, yes. um, how are you going to pay for that? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to economically destroy other neighbors. Exactly. And you're going to take property from them, right, F through coercion and uh, unjust taxation and those sorts of things. So the financial burden of this doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. All we're doing now is we're hating our children because we're taking the financial burden mm. and we're giving it to our children and grandchildren. Yeah. So again, love for neighbor is the supreme value here. And what I want to say pastorally is that we have to think about this in terms of love for neighbor across the board. Exactly. And yep. let, so, so um, real fast, somebody will say, no, it says submit your governing authorities. Okay. Um, we understand there's nuance to that mm -hmm. because all of our biblical heroes defied governing authorities at times when they were violating God's standards or God's word. And we recognize that we have to obey God rather than men. So, it, of course, we can ask the question, is this a time where we should biblically quarantine and shut down worship? I, let's ask that question. Yeah. What's it look like? What's yeah. the danger? Is this really, is, in reality, is this something that is worthy of decimating the economy and worship services and all the rest? I'd say personally with 40 cases in Arizona at the moment, probably not worthy of decimating the economy right. and destroying countless families and, and, and stopping worship services. But is it possible to get to a point where we have to quarantine? Yeah, and real, yeah, of course. But that's a decision, of course, elders have to make with biblical wisdom. But again, when someone says, obey your governing authorities, I would say the assumption is, is that they're acting as God's deacon, yeah. his servant, which is the word there. They're right. the servants of the true God, not some other God, but exactly. the true God. And then also, I want to point out to the person that just takes Romans 13 and spreads it like peanut butter, I want to say, you don't really believe that, do you? And if they say, well, what do you mean? Yes, I believe it. I would say, so, so you believe, say, for example, if I was to take something similar in terms of authority. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior, 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. There's another example of authority in Scripture. Mm. God ordained authority, Mm -hmm. husbands over wives, right? And it says, wives submit in everything to your husbands. That's even more descriptive, right? right? Um, Or prescriptive. Submit in everything to your husbands. Um, Now, we're doing counseling one day, and a man walks in with his wife, and his wife's beat up. And uh, she looks clearly abused, and she's in, a, in bad shape. And we find out he's physically abusive to her, or and we start hearing the story. Mm-hmm. And we find out this man is abusive to his wife emotionally, physically. And we find also he's telling her to do things that are ungodly. Yeah, unbiblical. Yeah. Unbiblical things, right? Now, he says to us, pastors, yeah. wives, submit to your, your, your husbands and everything. Right. You guys are being unbiblical. She just has to submit. Mm. We would say, no, there's nuance to that truth. Right. And the nuance is the assumption that you as a husband are acting in a godly and righteous manner worthy of being submitted to. Right. And that's the, that's the nuance to the text. Um, not peanut butter submit in everything so you can be abusive to your wife. Now, everyone knows that's the case when it comes to the authority of the husband over the wife in the home. But somehow, somehow, we believe that the government's prescriptive role of being God's servant and our, our, our command to obey the governing mm. authorities means all the time and everything. Right. Don't question it. It's unqualified. And now if somebody says, no, Jeff, I'm not saying it's unqualified, then I would say, fantastic. Thank you for granting my point. Yeah, exactly. That we have to use wise, biblical, godly standards in examining the behavior of the government and what they're doing. And I'll just throw this last thing out here and I want to hear what you have to say. This concerns us. We've been talking about it all day. The mayor of Kauai, where we have a church, Mm -hmm. is instituting a 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. If you violate it and leave your home or your hotel room, you will get up to a $5,000 fine and up to one year in jail. They're shutting down non-essential businesses across the country. San Francisco, three-week lockdown. They're taking private property from banks and others, and they're forcing the homeless population in San Francisco into um, uh, hotels and homes that have been foreclosed on that are owned by other people privately, and the government's saying, no, I'm going to take over your private property, and I'm going to force these people into them. Uh, You have Las Vegas shut down, except for all non-essential businesses. You've got Arizona, our cities, Mm. all. uh, I was mentioning to you numerous times this week, it's eerie going out there. Yes, there's traffic. Yes, there's people. We're passing by whole plazas where 95% of the businesses are closed. Mm. McDonald's is doing well. Yeah. Right? Right. I, I just went to a popular restaurant locally, and, and it's always packed, right. always, all day long. And there was four cars in the drive-through, and this was this was during mm. uh, rush hour, right? Yeah. And there's it's just so that's going to decimate the economy. And so again, the question is: Are these sane? Mm-hmm. Is this rational? Because someone says, "No, no, it's a real devastating uh, sickness." I would say I agree. Uh, that's right, and we face those all the time. Mm. I'm not saying that this is the same, but I'm saying that we all make a calculation, as Pastor James said this week on the dividing line. We all make a calculation. You may not like the terminology, but we all do a cost-benefit analysis daily. I could be killed in a car crash. I could kill someone in the car, but I still make the decision to go to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. I still make the decision to run to the store to grab food for my family, even though people die every single day on that road. It's a cost-benefit analysis. Every year, we have so many large numbers of people who die from the flu and pneumonia as a result of the flu and those sorts of things. We don't decimate the national economy because of it. Right. We don't do right. that because it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? So, of course, we should be taking measures to, say, protect ourselves, to love our neighbor. We, we've done that this week. Mm-hmm. When we found out that there were two people within our body that we love very, very much, mm-hmm who were in close contact with the medical field and had possibly contact with people who had novel uh, uh, coronavirus, we said it's best for right now that you stay quarantined from the church body. That's a decision the elders of a church make under the authority of the church. Wise biblical standards and love for your neighbor. But again, do we destroy all of our neighbors because we have 40 cases of coronavirus Mm. in the state? I say unwise, Mm. irrational, not sane, not pleasing to God, and it's hatred for neighbor. Mm. I'm not saying that if I've got pastor friends and brothers who disagree with me right now and say, no, we just need to go ahead and do it. 
that I'm going to go to war with them, or that I, I say, do what you're doing to the glory of God. But I think there should be a much more balanced approach to facing this that takes God's principles very seriously across the board. It doesn't elevate one principle over against the other right. at the detriment of families. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, this is all we talk about this on the radio show today. Just it's all about the spheres of government, and this is what we're seeing is the outcome of placing the state in in the role of savior. Of Messiah, and uh, you know, even even the pastors that will say, "Well, you know, Romans thirteen, Romans 13, you know, if the state tomorrow said uh, it's unloving of you, it's you're not loving your neighbor if you do not marry a gay couple. Those pastors aren't going to say Romans thirteen then, mm -hmm. right? And so the point is when you because it's when, immoral, exactly. So it's you know, Bonson said it's either God's law or it's some subjective law of man so when we make the state supreme ruler then they can subjectively uh establish any laws or rules that they want right they can subjectively determine which businesses are considered necessary and which ones are considered unnecessary they can you know subjectively determine what constitutes marriage and so our concern is if we don't base these decisions upon principles you're opening up a floodgate to whatever the government says goes. Um, and that's the biggest thing. And e even economically, you, you, you mentioned McDonald's. I think it was Marcus today that was like, all this is going to do for the economy is create monopolies. Because all the little mom and pop shops, they may not make it. Right. But the, the companies that are going to make it are the big, you know, box stores, McDonald's, Charmin, you know, like. Toilet paper is doing good <laughs> right they, now. If you're, if you're into stock trading, if Here's I, a tip. I, Get some Charmin stock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, if I would have known that Americans were very concerned with dying with clean butts, <laughs> I would have bought so much toilet paper ahead of time and just set up on the side of the road. When all these families couldn't find toilet paper, yeah. I would have just set up and been like, here, yeah. I'll sell it to you. And just, to just make, just make a, a little extra profit on it. It'd be a great business opportunity, yeah. yeah. Did you see, uh, was it last week, I think, I was looking on Amazon for any toilet paper that you could buy, and literally... The only toilet paper that was available on Amazon was a single roll, and it had Hillary's face on it, like pointing and laughing. It was like fifteen bucks per roll, and it was Hillary's face on each like Might have been roll worth it. of toilet paper. And it's, I just thought it was that's, so that's, ironic. That's cheap, that's, considering the experience. I just thought it was so ironic <laughs> that it was Hillary of all people. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, you, you're. I think you, you said something a second ago. I was like, oh, that's actually a powerful thought. When the government says, we'll determine which businesses are essential and which are non-essential, yeah. I'm sure there are so many working fathers and business owners right now who are responsible for feeding a lot of mouths and taking care of a lot of co uh, college tuitions and mm. all the rest who would like to raise their hands to the local governments and go, can, can mine be seen as essential? Exactly. Because it's essential to me. Yeah. It's essential to my daughter. It's essential to my wife. My business is very essential. To me. Mm -hmm. and, and so you make a good point. When the government becomes God and Messiah and we don't question the decisions they're making, right. they're going to make those determinations. And woe unto the pastor that sells to their congregation the idea of unlimited obedience to government, yeah. uh, government authorities. And somebody could say, no, Pastor Jeff, nobody's doing that. And I want to say, okay, not in principle. Right. Maybe you're willing to tell people that we need to obey God above men, but in practice... Mm -hmm. In practice, you're demonstrating unlimited obedience to the government when you see your neighbors being destroyed by a government decision that may not be wise. Right. And you just say, yield. What I want to say is, I, I'm sorry, I've got to feed too many people in our local church now and care for their needs yeah. and pay their rent mm. and, and put food on their table as a church body because of these decisions. Mm that may not be altogether necessary. Right. Um, you've got examples coming out of South Korea. South Korea, not shutting down, not shutting down like we are, not decimating the economy. And it, you're, seeing, you're seeing good numbers and mm. statistics in terms of where they're at in the curve 
and they didn't do what we did. Mm. Um, and so we just we need to ask questions in terms of what is the reach of government and role and responsibility. Again, this is all with an acknowledgement. I mean, everyone knows an apology at church. We believe God that in the general equity of God's law applied mm -hmm. today. Right. We don't believe that the law of God should be dropped down on society. Right. We want people to know Jesus. Their hearts are changed. They love God's law. But God is a just God. His standards don't change. Right. If he says something is immoral, it's immoral. If he Definitely. says it's righteous, it's righteous. And so when God gives us a, 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 a role in Scripture, we want to take that general equity. We want to apply it mm -hmm. to today. Everyone knows that about us. Um, and so, well... So our perspective is that when we look at the biblical law for laws of quarantine, mm -hmm. that does apply today. Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the laws in terms of separating out people who have uh, illnesses, leprosy, plague, whatever the case, we, we take those seriously. Right. We say that is, in fact, loving your neighbor. But we have to also recognize that the biblical law doesn't actually allow for you to decimate the world economy right. and all of your neighbors because you get a little freaked out. Mm -hmm. You don't even have all the data yet mm -hmm. and you're going to go ahead and shut everyone down uh, and you want to cite biblical quarantine laws and love for neighbor laws. Right. All these things need to be held in proper biblical balance before we just make quick decisions to destroy families. Absolutely. Which is what's happening. What's happening yeah. It is absolutely happening. Yeah. It is absolutely. So that's our concern. Um, anything else you want to add to that? No, I think it's good. Good discussion. Good place to start. So I, I guess we'll we'll put a we'll put a cap on this by saying, um, I you know what's amazing? I was looking at um, the last couple of weeks of um, preaching at Apology at Church. Mm. We switched from our Kingdom of God series, Great Tribulation stuff, End Time stuff, um, into Philippians right. to do some stuff for the health of our body. The last uh, couple of sermons I got to deliver was one, the gift of faith and suffering. Mm. Um, and then I got to, uh, then Pastor James did the thing about humility of mind, the mm. Carmen Christi, God humbling himself to the obedience of man. And then the next one was don't be anxious for anything. So mm. it was the gifts of faith and suffering, yeah. humbling yourself, serving others. And then it was do not be anxious about anything. Don't be worried. We didn't plan that. I mean, didn't, didn't plan it. And I thank the Lord that we got to do it. Yeah. So go check those out, guys. Apologiastudios.com is where you get all the information. I want to encourage everybody to go to endabortionnow.com to get more information on how your church can get involved in the fight to bring the gospel against abortion. And check out this shirt right here. By the way, two things I want to show you. What's the necklace? James gave that to me. Pastor James gave you a sweet necklace. It is pretty sweet, yeah. My wife was jealous. He literally threw it at me, though. Did he really? Because I had, like, just a little cough when we came back from Ireland. Yeah. And he, he literally, like, across the room was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's awesome. I'm fine. I don't yeah. have the Coronas. So, so the Coronas. The, I don't have the Corollas. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the necklace, and then tell them, tell them about the so shirt. So Let Them Live is uh, our end abortion now baby That's in right. Ireland. So uh, letthemlive.ie is our, our is the, uh, it's essentially end abortion now. We help them establish in, their, in Northern Ireland, and they are now hopefully going to be moving into the Republic of Ireland and also Scotland. So. Yes, yes. They're awesome. Yeah, same thing. Let them live. Praise yep. God for that. So if you guys ever gave towards End Abortion Now, uh, you helped to create the Christian movement against abortion in Northern Ireland, the yep. Republic, and also in Scotland. Let them live is what it is. I like how you said the End Abortion Now's baby. Yeah. That's a powerful thing. And so I want to thank everybody who gave towards End Abortion Now uh, for this year and all the past years because all of that is a part of the effort of our church to bring the gospel into conflict with abortion, to end it, to bring justice to the preborn, and it creates even things like this internationally. Amen. So if, the, if, if you um, have, have needed some encouragement today, uh, I want to encourage you, if you've been praying for a part of the mission of End Abortion Now, um, there's no telling how many babies are going to be saved in Ireland uh, because of End Abortion Now's baby. Yep. And um, you're a part of that. So thank you guys so much. Stay with us, guys. Stay in prayer. Be anxious about nothing. Rejoice always in everything. Give thanks. Trust in the sovereign God who is in control of every single detail of this. There is absolutely no reason to be fearful or worried if you're a child of God. If you don't know Jesus, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus is God in the flesh who lived a perfect life and died for sinners and rose again from the dead. All who come to him in faith receive life, eternal life. That's never ending. And... Um, Coronavirus is uh, nothing in, uh, in the scope of all of eternity. Yep. The most important thing is your walk with Jesus, not this temporarily 
uh, difficult uh, circumstance you find yourself in. So stay with us, guys, next week. Uh, more uh, next week with Jeff Durbin. Thank you, guys.